for being here tonight. Um, I'll try to be brief. I don't know if I mentioned this to you guys before. Um, Shelly and I are taking a financial course um, that lasts nine weeks. And it's to help us handle our money, but God's way. Uh, and in the very last class that we had, which was this past Monday, he referenced the scripture that I have been thinking about this as, as I have been talking to my sister this past few days, because I mentioned my sister before and the situation that it's happening in, in the church that she goes to and all those things. And Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now it says money there at the end, but I believe this applies to anything that we set our focus on that is not from God. In this case, it is the church and the leaders of that church. Her focus right now is on that. And because of this, she's no open to, she's not open to, you know, any, any advice that you can give her or, or to have any sort of conversation that you can try and share some of the things that you um, have had revealed to you by God. I mean, I'm talking about any person. She doesn't want to have conversations like this with my mother or, or she doesn't talk to me because she feels like I'm going to lecture her. I'm in no position to lecture anyone because I am I'm as, as bad as the next person, you know. But God loves me. And, you know, although she has this hold on her that these people have, and, and they have guilt her into all these things, and she has this fear that there's going to be retaliation towards her, I do believe that she will come out of that. And I know that the Lord is setting some things in motion that is going to help her open her eyes to see the reality that the church that she's going to is not a church that is actually helping her grow as a Christian, as a believer, as a child of God. She's just there to serve a purpose for these people. I know that when I go back home, If she were to ask me to go there, I would tell her no. I have no desire whatsoever to step foot in that place because my concern is that I will not be able to keep my mouth shut <laughs> and say something. <laughs> so <laughs> to avoid calling these people hypocrites or some sort of thing because I don't think this is going to help her get out of this situation. It actually it's going to embarrass her to the point that she will start apologizing to these people for my behavior, which from the human perspective, I don't think I'm wrong, but from the spiritual perspective, I know I am because the Bible says even this, the, the fool is considered wise when silent. So just want to keep my mouth shut. Uh, but I say at chapter 43, and this is why I am so hopeful that this will happen and she'll, she'll come to realize that she's not being fed properly. Starting from verse 8, and this is something that we sing here all the time. It says, bring out the people who are blind yet have eyes, who are deaf yet have, yet have ears. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring their witnesses to prove them right, and let them hear and say, It is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you, 
and you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Also, henceforth, I am he. There is no one who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? Those that have eyes that are blind, their eyes will be open. Those that have ears and are deaf, their ears will be open, and the truth will be revealed to them. And we're all going to come together because when we truly know or at least understand who God is and what we are to him, and we understand his love, we're drawn to each other. And as we are drawn to each other, and we come together, and we pray together, like it says in the Bible, and we witness to each other, and we share things, and we pursue the same things, his presence is manifested. Things happen. People are healed. Relationships are, are restored. People are delivered. Anything can happen like this. Amen. When you come together for the same purpose, just believe in him, trust in him, Pray, thank him for what he has already done, that we have we have his power within us. We just have to make sure that we tap into that power and declare the things that he has already told us that are for us and call them out. Yeah. You know, the things that are unseen, we call them out into this physical world. Yeah. So they're manifested in here, and those things serve as, as testimony for other people that might be, I don't know, on the verge of whether, should I believe, should I not believe? You know what? If God wants to use me to show you that he's real, then so be it. Yeah. If you want to use someone else to show you that he's real, if he wants to, I don't know, have lightning fall right next to you and nothing happen to you and you're like, whoa, you know, whatever it is. Let's all just come together and believe, you know, that we are who he says we are. And when we come together, great and wonderful things are going to happen. <laughs> uh, before I open the floor, I do have one prayer request. Kelly wanted to, she requested if we could pray and lift up her friend Nicole. Tomorrow she has an appointment with her OBGYN for her 12 week visit. She's pregnant around. And in the past year, she has had three miscarriages. And the last time that it happened, she found out on her 12-week visit to the doctor. I believe that this woman has a child in her future, and God's going to give it to her, and it's going to be this one that she has right now. So if we can stand and lift her up and declare that tomorrow, it's all going to be good news. Other prayer requests or testimonies? Yeah, Pastor. Uh, remember Erica, I think her last name is Erica Bell. She has a friend. And she asked for, uh, she requested prayer uh, for just for all of these. She's in a kind of messed up situation and she needed some direction. And uh, she just asked for her to pray that God would just bring it all together. Just bring up all the confusion. Good.
that's a good thing because those machines are pricey. I have one too. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Tammy. Um, I just want to praise the Lord that His wishes just been awesome for me because I mean I've known for some time that I am the righteousness of God in Christ and that uh, all the promises, you know, everything I set my hand to prospers, no weapon formed against me. I mean I know those. stand <clears throat> and let's come to the Lord tonight Father we thank you tonight for bringing us together here gathering your name we thank you Lord for revealing us your truth and giving us your word a word Father that we go out into this world and speak to those that don't know who you are that they might know who you are but they don't understand truly what they mean to you and how much you love them we thank you Father because we have the expectation to have good things that we receive from you. We thank you, Father, because you always give us direction. So right now we lift up Erica. We put that situation in your hands, Lord, and we know that you're going to give her the wisdom that she needs, the clarity. You're going to align her thoughts to your will for her life, and she's going to be pointed into the path that you want her to walk in. We know, Lord, that you're going to give her direction because she is walking, Lord, seeking you, listening to you, trying to see what it is that you want her to do and I know, we know that you will reveal that to her. Right now Father we also lift up the call we know Lord that you have a child for this woman's future and we know Father that tomorrow in your mighty name we declare right now that the doctor will have nothing but good news for her and that baby is going to be healthy and it's going to come to full term and she's going to have a child she's so right to serve the blessing that you will give her the gift of motherhood Broken. 
broken in an instant. In Jesus' name. So we declare that all of those that have eyes but cannot see, and those that have ears but cannot hear, that their eyes will be open and their ears will be open and they will come boldly to you. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for everything you do, for giving us the boldness to go out into this world and speak your word unto others. Show them who you are. Expanding the kingdom, Lord, this Holy Spirit that lives inside of us will give us more words that we are to speak in whatever situation that we don't know. Because you live in us, Lord. We are one with you. You call us your children, Heavenly Father, who are out of this world, Lord, as representatives of Jesus on this earth, spreading your love. Turn your phone off. Mine's good. All right, well, let's speak the word tonight since we don't have any more announcements. Will you not revive again? And your people may rejoice in you. Two years ago, Pastor, when you preached your sermon on Sunday, you said this. When Jesus is revealed, only two things can happen. Either they convert or they get angry. Mm -hmm. 
us to what the Lord has today for us. Amen. <laughs> I love it. Doesn't matter if it's two days, two weeks, two years. Before. That's right. It's all the same. All right.
Nothing can take it away, Lord. You are constant, Lord, and never changing, Lord. Your covenant remains. Your love will never go away. Your grace will cover us, Lord, forever and ever and ever and ever, Lord.
love you tonight. We bless you. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you are a holy God. Thank you, Jesus, that you fulfilled all righteousness, that we might be presented holy in the presence of God, not because of our works, but because of your works. For you are holy, Lord, and because of your holiness, hallelujah, we have been accepted in the beloved. We bless you tonight, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, that you've never diminished your demand for holiness. You are a holy God. Holiness 
is of the Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are just and the justifier. We bless your name tonight. In Jesus' name. Everybody said praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you and give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Amen. Roberto, if you can find the translation that is in uh, giant print. Great. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. This has been one of those days. Hallelujah. Amen. I, I've told almost everybody, but uh, well, we had a little issue at our house. The electricity is off for about 500 homes. I don't know where all, but certainly we're in the middle of all of that mess. It's about 5 o'clock, and so I was fumbling around in the dark in our bedroom and the bathroom, and I had a lantern in the bathroom trying to, so I could do what I had to do and all that stuff. And in the meantime, I had cleaned one pair of glasses, and I laid them on the dresser. Well, then I grabbed a watch, and I couldn't even find the one I usually wear. I grabbed this other one, which is one that goes by solar batteries, and uh, it has to be in light. I mean, it doesn't have to be bright sunlight, but it has to be in light. So I got that, and I get out in the kitchen, and it's dead. It's 7 o'clock the day before or something. And so I wound it and set it and set it in the sun in the kitchen on the counter, and then Sally pulled the shades Praise the Lord. We're, we're a team, you know, we're always working together. You know, finely tuned machine here. And uh, so that kind of slowed me down a little bit and got me distracted. And, and I was having to go to a different bathroom to try to comb my hair, what little there is. And uh, finally kind of got all that stuff together and we were getting ready to leave. And Izzy was telling me we had to leave, but we couldn't go out, we couldn't open the door to do it because something buzzed around her out there, a hornet. And so I told her, I gave her some great wisdom that we can't go out unless we open a door. So you know, we're going to have to just. And in the meantime, with all this wisdom I was imparting, I left my glasses in the on the dresser. So I don't. I only wear them so I can see. And uh, so I came in with my drove in with my sunglasses because the sun coming from the east at this time of day or that time of day, the sun's right in my face all the way, and so I'm wearing sunglasses and I got the thing up. I get down here and realize I don't have any glasses, so I, uh, you know, wisely have left this pair here, but they're like 10 years old, and they're actually worse than not wearing any at all now because there's a different prescription, and so pray for me, saints. Praise the Lord. Hopefully, I know this message well enough here that I, my notes won't totally distract me. The other thing is, can I see the Word of God because I can't really read it very well here, but God is good, isn't he? Yeah. Praise the Lord. And, uh, you know, when all is lost, I just say call the IRS. They can find anything. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> we just had our taxes done here a few weeks back, a couple weeks ago, in fact. I got a thing from the state of Iowa already. I hadn't even paid them yet. I mean, we sent the forms in, obviously, but I, I wait till the last minute. I'm not paying them until till the day, deadline, you know. So, I mean, I got the money in the bank. We pay it into the bank as the year goes on, but I, I'm not giving it to them until I have to. No, I'm not unpatriotic. I'm just cheap, just stingy. But anyway, I get a thing from the state of Iowa saying that, oh, another hundred and whatever it is, 40-some bucks or something. And I can't, you know, you got to be a lawyer and a CPA and everything else to even read the document that they sent. So I had to take it back to the tax people. And or Sal, actually, Sally took it over and dropped it off. And they called back and gave me this great bit of wisdom that they had uh, been filing my taxes as though I lived in Polk County because when I originally hired this CPA, this Hudson is who it used to be, I'm talking 25 years ago, we lived in Ankeny and uh, so that was on their records. Now that worries me a little bit because we've lived in Jasper County for 15, 16, almost 17 years now. I'm wondering what else they might have left out, praise God, but uh, anyway, I said, well that can't be right, what are, you, what are we talking uh, County or, or, or uh, yeah, county taxes are cheaper than in Jasper by a bunch. Property taxes are way cheaper than they are in Polk County. Well, they've figured out a way of offsetting that a little bit, and that's because they raise the school taxes in Jasper County because they don't get as much out of the property taxes. Anyway, that's gonna that's 140 some bucks that I was gonna 
threw a big party for all of you, but I'm sorry, praise the Lord. We'll have to just wait till next year. All right? God's good, though, right? Thank God I got the 140 bucks, or hopefully I will have by the 30th of uh, April, praise God. God is good. Amen. Okay, let's, uh, let's begin with uh, Luke chapter 18, and we'll read verses 9 through 14. Luke 18, uh, verses 9 through 14, and praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. Appreciate you all being here tonight. And I'm keeping these because I've got I to take these home with me even though I don't wear them because they'll blind me driving home. But if I get stopped by the police for being on the wrong side of the road, I'm obligated to be wearing glasses <laughs> while I'm driving. It's, a, you know, it's on my license. So. It's on that little thing on the back where you know I've, he can ride a motorcycle, but whenever he's driving anything, he's got to have glasses on. So, so I've got to take these with me even though they'll blind me. But. I won't wear them unless I get stopped. Forgive me, Lord. Okay, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the... Now, I want you to notice, first of all, verse 9 again. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Okay? Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess, and the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Praise the Lord. So, uh, the Pharisee is full of himself. The tax collector is at the end of himself. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 23, verses 4 and 5. I want you to notice the contrast between this and the next scripture that we'll bring up here. But For they blind or excuse me, they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. Talking about the Pharisees, obviously. That's all external. It's all about bondage. Amen? All right, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. And I would I'd just suggest to you, this is revival. If the other is bondage, if the other is, you know, not really moving anywhere towards God, but just about what people are doing, I'd say this is revival. This is what I think will always bring revival, and that's the Spirit of God, of course. And, and Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. What is the gospel? He says it's the gospel of grace, and Paul called it the gospel of grace throughout the entire Bible. The gospel is the gospel of grace. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Amen? So he's preaching deliverance to the captives, setting people free. So this is an internal thing, whereas the other was external and bringing about bondage and, and control. This is an internal thing, a spiritual thing coming from the Spirit, amen, and it's setting people free. Yes. That would be revival, amen. That, that's what true revival really is. And we have a lot of things that we call revival, but I don't know that they are, by definition, revival. There, there may be awakenings, they may be revelations, there may be a lot of things but they're not necessarily revival. This, revival should set people free. Yes. Even people, amen, who are already, revival begins in the house of God. I mean, revival begins with the church. You can't, yes. unless the church gets revived, there's no way you're going to be revival to anybody else. Praise God. So, now let's go to 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Praise God. So, 
you know, we, we want revival. I want revival personally, and I obviously want revival for the church because it's fundamental to bringing revival to everybody else. Amen. And that's who God's after, everybody. Amen? Amen? So that's what I'm focusing on because I believe that's what eventually will bring about the revival that God intends for this last day. Jesus brought it to his day. He brought revival. Now, it didn't look like revival at the time. It looked like just the opposite, because just like what Roberto said, uh, you know, when you, when you bring the truth to people, they're either going to be changed by that truth or they're going to get mad about it. Because it challenges their already presupposed position or, or belief system, amen? And nobody likes to be wrong. So now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elijah, saying, the ser Thy servant, my husband, is dead. Thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor has come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elijah said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. And then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and thou shalt pour out into all these vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her sons, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children on the rest. Praise the Lord. So, how many of you know the scripture, we had this treasure in earthen vessels? Yes. Praise the Lord. God loves to fill empty things. And vessels or jars are made for filling. Yes. They don't fill themselves. Right. Praise the Lord. They just receive what's poured into them. Yes. Now, we've already kind of looked at that in a different context, the outward bondage and uh, uh, thinking they're already full, not realizing they're empty, they can't be filled. Right? You've got to be empty first in order to be filled. Right. Amen. So empty vessels are empty so that they can be filled. They just receive whatever's poured into them. Every vessel begins with emptiness. You make a pot, you make a jar, you make a vessel of any kind, and it starts its life out empty. Right. Praise the Lord. The measure of filling that we receive is in direct proportion to the level of emptiness. Praise God. Now, I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm talking about our awareness of this is about Him. It's about grace. Until we realize this is all about grace, we're still partially filled vessels. We're filled with us, but we still got stuff in us so that we can't get the fullness of what God wants to give us so that we can't produce we can't pour out, we can't provide, we can't have uh, enough for ourselves and more for others if we're half full, if we're, if we're half full of us or half full of uh, our sense of, uh, of righteousness and so on and so forth. Praise the Lord. All right, John chapter 4, verses uh, 13 and 14. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Amen. Okay, drop down to verse 28 through 30 now, Roberto. Same chapter, but uh, 28 through 30. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. So this, this woman at the well's life was empty. Jesus fills her with living water. Praise the Lord. All right, let's look at John chapter 6, uh, verses 11 and 12. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, mm -hmm. praise the Lord, 
when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. And we know that then there was like 12 baskets more than what they started with and so on and so forth. But, but the point is, the crowd was empty. Empty stomachs. Amen? What does Jesus do? He fills them. Now, th if you go through the Gospels, throughout the Gospels, there's, there's really one story. And the story is two words. Jesus fills. He satisfies. Amen? He's more than enough. Praise God. People, at the end of their abilities, at the end of their strength, at the end of their resources, he gives them a new beginning. But you have to come to the end of you first. You have to get to the place where you're going to turn to him and trust in him in order for yourself to be filled. Whatever the emptiness is, whatever the lack is, he is the source. He is the means, right? If you look at the Old Testament, Jehovah, Yahweh, all of the names of the Old Testament, and we know that his name is the name that's above all of those names, uh, Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides. Yes. He's the source for whatever it is, whether it's healing, whether it's financial, whether it's relational, whatever it is. He is the means, amen, to satisfy that lacking in us. And Jesus is all of that Amen, in the flesh. Gave him a name that's above every name. Not, he's not talking about John and Fred and Bill and Nathan and Tobin and Tim, you know. He's talking about every name that, that is recognized as God. He has a name that has been lifted above all of that. Savior, God with us, Emmanuel, amen. The source of everything has come to us, praise the Lord. And he wants to fill us up. Praise the Lord. Paul, Paul says to live, you have to die first. Look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Amen? So the end of us is where real life begins. So... To be filled, we need to be filled with life. He, he's the life. Yes. And we can't receive his life until we die. Exactly. Until our life is out of the way. Exactly. Praise God. No one wants to talk about death. So we say things like, well, they've passed on. They've crossed over. God needed an angel and all sorts of things. Anything but dead. Jesus urges us to die, not physically, but dying to ourselves, to our resources, our abilities, because we always come up short. Amen? Matthew chapter 16, uh, verses 24 and 25. And, and honestly, this is the liberating uh, reality of the gospel. We, str we struggle to hang on to life. And the fact is, we can't really live until we let go of it. Exactly. And once we let go of it, we realize how liberating it is. Yes. Praise the Lord. So then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. He's not talking about being killed or martyred for the name of Jesus. Now that could apply, but that's not the context in which he's speaking of. He's, he's talking about losing our life for his life. Give up our life so we can have his life. We're going to find what real life is. Praise the Lord. So how do we do it? How do we die? You know? Well, I can tell you, I've been around my share of dead people. I've uh, been with families, you know, when the coroner came and pronounced them dead. I've been there when they were rushed to the hospital, and I get there, and they've already been pronounced dead, and the family's just starting to gather. I, I, I've stood next to open caskets as, you know, friends and family walk by to say their final farewells to the flesh. And I'm not trying to be flip or just, you know, funny, but I've noticed something about dead people. They don't seem to care much what other people think of them. They just don't care. 
Amen? When Jesus talks about dying to ourselves, it's this that he's talking about. Dead to self. Praise the Lord. No longer depending on our abilities, our strength, our opinions, even our experiences and circumstances. But alive to God, alive to his word, alive to his promises, alive to whatever God has said about the situation and not what it looks like to me. Amen? John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus says it's, it's death that leads the way to life. When I come to the end of me, when I deny my opinion, my logic, and the logic of other men and women like me, I begin to feel free. I begin to realize, once I realize I can't fix it, I realize it's fixable. As soon as I back away and just trust in what God has said, his promise, all of a sudden, I'm free. I don't have to carry the stress. I don't have to carry the burden. I don't have to carry the worry, the fear, the anxiety. You know, we live in a time, and I get it, where... You know, if we're not worried, we think there's something wrong with us. The truth is just the opposite. Cast all your care upon me. Right? Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God. You can't worry your way into a perfect prayer. You can't be anxious enough uh, to make God do something on your behalf. You've got to let it go. You've got to let yourself go and trust in him. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses 9 and 10. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Praise God. See, it's not about what you can do. It's not about what I can do. It's not your strength that's necessary. At the end of Jesus' earthly life, when uh, he came to the end of himself, he was at the beginning of what would change everything. Yes. Praise the Lord. At the end of death comes the beginning. Resurrection. Power of the Spirit. It's true even when we die to ourselves. There is a resurrection process that takes place. Christ in us begins to flourish. He begins to move. He begins to do the things that only our death can perpetuate. That's why he keeps telling us, if you die, take up your cross and follow me. We know we have been crucified with Christ, yet we live, but it's not us that live, it's Christ in us. Well, unless we're willing to die daily, that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about perfection in the way we live our lives. He's talking about we have to give up our strength, our abilities, our thoughts, our resources, and renew our minds to the truth of God's word and die out to us so that life, resurrection life, can come alive, so that God can move in us and through us. Praise the Lord. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves. See it? This is Paul. We had the sentence of death in ourselves so that we wouldn't trust in ourselves, but in God, which raises the dead. This is exactly what I just said about resurrection. Dying becomes resurrection. That's Paul. That's what Paul's actually saying here. See, we had a sentence of death in ourselves. In other words, we have to die. We got to be crucified. We got to die so that we wouldn't trust in us anymore. 
but in God who can raise the dead, who can bring resurrection life, amen, into us. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Ver drop down to verses 19 uh, through 22. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timoth Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. It wasn't yes and no in him. In him it was just yes. How many of you know in us it's yes and no? Amen. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But in him it's always yes. Praise the Lord. For all the promises of God in him are yes. And in him, amen. So be it, praise the Lord, unto the glory of God by us. Now he which establisheth with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. In other words, he's given us resurrection life. He's given us the ability to operate, amen, as in this new life, in resurrection life. But the, we got to die. Praise the Lord. We've got to diminish so that he can increase. Praise the Lord. Every time we come to the end of ourselves, every time we acknowledge our emptiness, every time we die to us, new life is the result. We begin anew. Amen? We're filled. We're alive in Christ where everything is possible and nothing is impossible. That's real life. And that is abundant life. And it only comes in Christ. Can you say praise the Lord? Amen. Give him a hand clap. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's, it really isn't complicated because it is the gospel. Yeah. It's the truth. We just have to remind ourselves on a continuous basis. Because this life demands of us. Yeah. Praise the Lord. The problem is it's just like the law. We can never satisfy everything this life demands of us. But he can. He has already. Amen. We just have to die to this so that he can fulfill every need, every situation, and every circumstance. Yes. Praise God. And he's more than able and certainly more than willing to do it if we will just die Amen. and watch the resurrection life Amen. come forth. That's revival. We need it personally. And until we experience it personally, it's impossible to share it with anybody else so that everybody can experience it. Amen? Amen. Jesus had to do it. Look, if he had to, there's not another shortcut for us. There isn't some other way around this. We have to die to ourselves so that this resurrection life can go forth. And God is glorified in that. Amen? Amen. God bless all of you. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'll give you a head start. About five minutes, and then we'll look out, because I'll be on the road. Praise the Lord. God bless you all. Thanks for being here. Hope to see you back here Sunday. Have a great rest of your week. You're dismissed in his name.